Hello, this is Rakin, and the October 1st Cloud 2030 group was about data gravity hosted by the infamous Dave McCrory, um, who had just announced some really um, remarkable improvements, enhancements, and extensions to his data gravity theory, which he talks about in this session. Strongly recommend doing it. It will make you think because it's not just about storage of data, but activity of data. So stay tuned. We had a great conversation from the icebreaker on. So you get the whole thing, enjoy, and join the 2030.cloud group. We would love to have you hear your opinions, get your thoughts, be part of the conversation. Enjoy. My, my thought was what piece of data do you, um, would, would you have destroyed forever if you could? Um, and that, and that was one of the <laughs> Dave, I was reading through everything. And then my question was, like, I want, I didn't really care about how much data was being paid per second. I want to know how much data was being lost forever each second, because I'm assuming that still 90% 90, 90 of the exhaust is being, never being saved. Um, and I think that's okay. Or hope, hopefully most of it's not being saved. <laughs> You know, I think a lot of it's being saved. It's for how long it's saved. Uh, yeah. That's the question. And then, um, and then, then is, the other question would be at what, so there are different rates, right? There's also what's the rate at which um, the data is being destroyed? What's the rate at which the data is lost versus what's the rate at which it's being created? Um, and then how, and do you kind of what the rate are, and if you're trying to create time series data based off of the data that you're destroying, how valuable is that? So in other words, are you going to be creating some sort of metadata or, uh, of, the, of the records of the data you destroyed? Well, yeah, the, I think one of the problems with, uh, with metadata is if you don't have the underlying data you're kind of left with left with this empty um, empty summary or empty set of assumptions that you can't truly back up because you just know it was based on something, but that something's gone now. But um, you, but you, so you, but you have to keep that data to test the assumptions for a certain period of time. But after a point, you can't keep on testing those assumptions in per perpetuity. You have to basically say, okay, we've tested it enough. That's enough. We can't. We're not going to test everything it, forever. It depends um, on. It depends on the situation. There are situations where, in order to recreate um, a problem or an event, you need the highest level of precision you can get, and you might want to recreate that event um, far into the future and be able to go back in the past and recreate that. Um, there are like all sorts of things uh, in the military where they wanted to recreate events and they found that they didn't have a high enough resolution of data to be able to recreate the events um, properly. And so without that level, then it's lost. You can't I agree. That. And, I, and I, I also think the, the corporate risk aversion is so high that people, um, people, theory, what people think they need to save versus what they actually need to be saved, there's a big uh, variance. There is, there's a huge variance. Um, you have the people that want to save everything, which is a huge problem because um, uh, you can't save everything uh, uh, in perpetuity. It doesn't work, it, at least it doesn't work practically in the fact that um, data's, data production is growing exponentially, yet our ability to store the data is not. Uh, so therefore, you can't keep everything forever. Um, it, it, it doesn't work. So there's yeah, going to have to be, there has to be a compromise of deciding uh, the value of what the data you have is uh, that you're trying to keep versus the risk of keeping that data and the cost of keeping the data. Okay, um, so I should probably, I'm gonna try to keep quiet because I am um, <laughs> verbose on the subject. Good, hey, fun. good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, 
we got the people are coming in because we're at the right time. I actually would love to hear a roundtable on the icebreaker question and see see where people go with that. Uh, so let me let me rephrase it in just a minute, and then we'll we'll get get running. So the the ice the icebreaker question I thought of um, was what piece of data from your past would you want destroyed if you could get it if you could have it destroyed. Um, which, which to me comes back to basically, you know, yearbooks and, and, and. Uh, I was going <laughs> to. Go ahead. I, I, Rob, I would go with my first marriage certificate. <laughs> I would go for the record where they where I was denied uh, top security clearance for when I, when I was applying to work for the um, Secretary of Commerce. It's a, it's a interesting question. If it's a if it's a single piece of data that uh, it would be that I would want to lead it forever or disappear. Um, huh. I don't know. I think I would say, um, I think I'd say my, uh, my social security number. Just to add a little controversy to things. Well, I think that's a good one. Although in retrospect, I think what I would like to uh, remove from outside uh, visibility is my uh, DNA sequence. Mm -hmm. Ooh. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah that's pretty deep. Good. I like that. I mean, 23andMe hasn't really, they haven't sold me out yet, as far as I can tell, but um, in retrospect, don't so, think I wanted them to have it and have that kind of control of it, that kind so, of use of it. So, Rich, just so you know, uh, you can actually request uh, your data to not only be fully removed, but for the sample to be destroyed. Yes, um, I do know that. Which I did that a few years ago after seeing kind of what was happening. I was like, I, I want this gone. I don't know if they really did it, but... Well, the problem uh, is that they are, they have shared... DNA, yeah. some of it anonymized, and also there have been mm, services like the uh, ancestry services that will take it. Now, if you have 23andMe, destroy it. Ancestry still got it. They are not under obligations at this point, as far as I know, to um, <laughs> follow along with that. Yeah, I think you'd have to file some kind of legal thing to force yeah. them to actually remove the data. Um, that might not be a bad thing. Mike, are you gonna? Do you want me to voice that for you since you just put it in the chat and made me laugh out loud? You said, "Yeah." So, yeah, ever <laughs> my VMworld re registration. Ever since signing up on Tuesday, I've gotten a ton of spam. And I don't even use VMware. <laughs> That's I, that is, I you know the these virtual conferences are going to generate much more, like, cruise by registrations. They're going to be a gold mine from an email perspective. Yeah. As a as a quasi marketer who gets insight into that. I can tell you that if you if you complain to the to the marketing teams on that, why am I on this list? I am getting spammed way too much with it. Oh, it gets attention more so than you would more so than you would think. Interesting. Just like just attention, don't, just, like just they're going to spam you more attention. <laughs> oh no, they will, you'll get off those lists real quick. The last thing, okay. the last thing any any company wants is for their customers to feel like they are getting too much. There's an entire science behind how many touch points a company will make 
uh, to a, you know, to customers. So they're, the good ones are really paying attention to uh, the multiple lists that they, that they, that they're going out with and that they're, and that they're, they're hitting. There's a, uh, there are, there are cadences that happen there. So if you ever want to, if you ever want to get off of one, just get, just get vocal on it. They hate that. I'd like to get off everything. Well, it becomes an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, well, one, I mean, one of the best, one of the best things is you know just the quick, easy unsubscribe button, just in just on the top of e any of the email pro programs now. It's like done that and just block. But Rob is absolutely right. The drive by I'm um, scanning, like at um, uh, at AWS mm -hmm. conferences, where they just come and scan your thingamajigger. And then you start getting, you know, logs the I.O. like forever. Yeah. So. I, I actually have in Gmail filtering, folks. It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, actually, zero, so I, go ahead, Simon. I have zero spam. It's called Gmail. Uh, I wish that I wish it was working as well for me. Maybe I need to get more time. I was I, I switched my background so that this this picture. There's a story behind this picture that's actually relevant to the conversation. So this is a um, Dave will appreciate the reference. It's a Times Picayune uh, photo from my uh, my wife and I when we were in New Orleans in uh, twenty in 1993. Just to give you a sense of it. Um, we went to a party, we were photographed by the newspaper and they put this in their archive and then they decided to sell their archives. Um, and somebody cataloged the old photographs from the newspaper and sold that picture on eBay. Oh, there's a YouTube so video. So my mother-in-law found it, bought it and paid like 40 bucks That's for that awesome. picture. That's There's a YouTube awesome. series of a guy that tracked down the model in a photo frame he bought at CVS. And he tracked it down. It's a modeling agency from 20 years ago from some girl who went in one day to take a picture and he tracked her down. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, he's okay. Gravity. That's, I mean, that's insane. But, but what's going to happen now with all these digital assets when, you know, a media company goes out of business or decides it needs some cash and it sells all of its footage, all its video, all of its, right, never made it to air and says, oh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll sell it for, you know, $100,000 to a data analytics company and, and go, right? The... I think that... I think that's one of the many problems we're just starting to see with that data that uh, that you think is going to be um, curated and protected and the company goes out of business, sells it to the highest bidder, whoever that happens to be, and then the data is used in all sorts of ways that uh, that no one at the time intended or believed that it would ever be used for. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll see a lot more of that in the future, unfortunately. Even, even, even oh, the Dave, brand, that'll even never the happen. brands that we know, <laughs> right? I mean, even the brands that, you know, my, my space, AOL, pick yeah, one, right. right? That were, that were the Facebooks and Twitters of their time. Where are they? Right. They're gone. It will happen. <laughs> like it, these companies are fleeting. Well, it, not, not just that, but um, um, a couple of years back, uh, NCAX, a, a, like computer hardware, like the customer facing uh, uh, shipping and provider company, they, they, they went down and they sold their servers. And it turned out they didn't wipe their servers. So all of their customer information was available to whoever purchased them. Yeah. Wow. It also makes you wonder about um, transactional data that's held by a company. Um, and what happens to that transactional data when the company goes out of business, especially at least here in the US, you have all of these small businesses going out of business. Um, there could be a company that decides to come and, and acquire the data and offer them a small amount of money to acquire an incredibly large amount of, of data. Um, Palantir. FTC is supposed to be yeah, a of regulating that, but they don't have a lot of enforcement power. 
I don't I don't see I don't see any protection. Um, I, I'm saying that there is there's just no enforced way to enforce right. the protection. There are yeah. laws and regulations on the books. How do you enforce it? Is a different story. Yeah, that's right. Basically, if you collected, so, you collected it under the law, there's and there's way to there's ways to enforce it. You buy if you if you buy something that was collected under a certain right, technically you're obligated to abide by those rights. Still, it's you can't enforce it. That's my understanding of the law. Maybe I don't understand it correctly, but I um. This that's the way I've understood it when I was when I've sat in, in the seminars and the government discussions in the past. Okay, that's right. I think part by the way, I think that every single individual <clears throat> believes that their personal information is compromised and um, that there is no enforcement and therefore they're on their own. They've got to fight this battle on their own. I think that's probably accurate, unfortunately, right now, mm -hmm. uh, even though it shouldn't be. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with that as well. And, and uh, this is more of a question than a statement because I don't know the answer. Um, but uh, I've never seen any evidence that there is um, traceability. So as an example, if somebody did sell a disk worth of emails and phone numbers and titles to someone as just a dumb example, um, what's the traceability for guaranteeing that uh, they acquired those addresses legitimately uh, or you know, not through their own best behavior? I don't know the exact information. I do know that people that are in this group, either not, maybe not here today, but in, gen but in this larger community, have an understanding of data providence technologies that sometimes actually use the word blockchain in their, in their description. So. <laughs> I'm just, sometimes they do. I'm just saying. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> I get another adult. discussion, though. Okay. <laughs> he he said problem, you have to drink. Over. You have to drink. <laughs> it's a bit early. Yeah. I, I, the the data weighted subject, um, where it has weight and people fall in or applications fall into it. I wouldn't want to use the name. I might get um, abused by the owner of the name of whatever that is. But um, yeah. no. To to answer your question, no data providence is great. <laughs> But, um, you know, it, it only works when someone is busted and somebody goes through a major audit of where they got data and how that's traced, et cetera. But even then, the, the problem here is not that somebody emailed an entire village of people and then the entire village of people went to the SEC or the F FCC and said, what the hell's going on here? Right. Um, it's individuals from all over the map. There is zero traceability at that point zero value in traceability for uh, governing bodies and so in in reality most data that's acquired becomes effectively free to use because the, of that individual traceability well it's the same as the compromise uh, actually that's not quite that's not quite true the the fact is that there are enough tools and there are enough forensics to do some pretty interesting uh, kind of traceability back to the kinds of sources. What you have to, you have to separate is the provenance, the, the, the ability to trace it from the protection from the litigation and the, and the you know, enforcement, I think is what you're, what you're really talking about. There are, there are more there are more technologies in place for lineage, technical lineage, business lineage, business provenance, and there are better tools for forensics. Um, but it's it's still for the all, for all intents and purposes, you've got a you've got a wild west there. Yeah, and I mean that, that I think this is sort of a parallel to. Um, uh, another uh, similar problem from a from a data protection standpoint, but let, let's. I want to just wrap up on the on that comment. So I agree with you. I mean, I know that you could track almost anything eventually if you really wanted to. The issue is um, 
the only way that anyone would ever get pushed, it likely get pushed into identifying where data came from or a governing body chased down where that data came from would be if it were some sort of mass emailing where the people impacted could quickly correlate. And because of the reporting method, it was correlated that these all came from the same people all at the same time. What's the coincidence? And that's unlikely, right? And that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that everyone knows their data has value, their individual data. But we also should know that this panel might be worth a hundred bucks, but for any one of us, the value of our data is meaningless, which is why we give it away for so free. Is there a business opportunity in um, creating community value from data? Mm, that's useful. McCoy will know. Interesting thought. So I, <laughs> as always, uh, the discussion sets the table, the appetizer for the, the main course. So Dave, <laughs> um, I, can you, you've been, we have a ton of news about data gravity. So um, I don't, I'm, we can't, we can't not have you define it because that's like status quo, but I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you and, and launch us into a discussion. We want to chew on this some. I mean, I think a couple of things. Um, one, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how my thinking around data gravity has, has evolved, especially over the last couple of years. And then also early on in the, uh, in the chat, there's a, a question that I think that's pretty interesting uh, that talks about, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, it was, uh, uh, yeah, is edge reversing data gravity or does data just naturally need to coalesce at a location? So I think, um, I think my, uh, I think my kind of updated thinking will, will begin to talk to that and we should end up with some interesting conversations. Um, the, Originally, my idea behind data gravity was that you simply had a mass of data that would accumulate originally in the clouds because that's where we were seeing large amounts of data um, that was popular uh, back in 2010 when, uh, when you saw the likes of uh, force.com coming as well as AWS. Uh, so you'd have a mass of data and as that mass of data grew, uh, you would see an attractive force with applications and services being attracted to be closer to the data because of advantages um, in the network, specifically uh, some combination of lower latency and higher bandwidth. So that was kind of what I call data gravity uh, definition 1.0 um, that's really effectively lasted all the way until now. Um, I've kind of updated my thinking and I see another form of data gravity that exists, um, and that is with data activity. So you end up with uh, activity being either um, the creation or movement uh, of data. So that would be a, a one broad term for data activity. It's intentionally nebulous, by the way, as, as activity because it can be used in, in quite a few different ways. But in this example, we'll talk about data creation and, uh, and processing. So you can have intense amounts of data creation and processing that can also create that same gravitational effect that just having a large mass of data does. You can look at it as the relationship between um, mass and energy, uh, same type of thing. Uh, if you have a large ball of energy, say the sun, it has a gravitational effect um, and applies in the same ways as just something that has a specific mass. So there's a relationship there as well with the existence of data gravity. If you have a lot of intensive uh, access or activity or creation, that can create that same gravitational effect that you see if you have a big mass of data. Uh, so both things um, uh, are data gravity. It's just which thing we're, uh, we're applying at a given time and that rolls into the, is edge reversing data gravity? Um, or does data just naturally need to coalesce at a location? I think, it, I think it's attracted, it's what's attracting it. Is it the sheer volume and mass of the data? Or is it this higher energy state of lots of activity occurring? And 
you're actually better off being closer to where the high activity is than you are where, say, a particular mass is. Uh, so I think there's a relationship between the two, and, uh, and that relationship feeds into a whole number of different things. Um, so I don't know if that, uh, if that makes sense uh, or not. makes it so this is simon sorry i'm fighting with my kids for bandwidth um it makes sense but i worry that we we just talk about data and not the well there's huge volume but some of it is of more value than others or at least applications work on state and not data and so it's that transformation that makes things valuable and we fail to track the value proposition associated with data through its lifetime. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's actually something that um, that's something that is really the majority of what I'm uh, dedicating my book on is specifically that topic. Um, that the books probably will be out. I would say in the Mayish time frame of, of next year. Um, but it's absolutely a problem of uh, what is valuable in our data uh, and what is not, and how do you recognize that value? How do you measure the value of data? Um, and uh, what does a, how does a business person kind of posit what is valuable in their data and what isn't? And how do you discover uh, if data is valuable now versus could it be valuable in the future? Uh, and does it make sense to hold on to that data for a period of time? Uh, does it make sense to hold on to it in perpetuity? Or should you really effectively be using it as transient data where it's here for a second and gone the next because the value or even potential value in the future just uh, isn't going to be high enough to justify the expense and risk of keeping that data for an extended period of time. So I have a question, Dave. Yes. Yeah, so um, is it possible that uh, frequency of request could be a proxy for value and retention of certain data? It's possible. I think it depends on the context of uh, the situation and the data being used. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have high frequency access to a specific piece of data, uh, it can certainly be an indicator uh, of value. It certainly has some type of value in whatever's accessing it. The question is, what is accessing it? Is it a, uh, is it a poorly written program that, um, that could have cached that data and simply used that data uh, internally to the program? Is it a pointless service that someone wrote that just keeps effectively pinging that same bit of data? Or is it unique users um, looking at a post that uh, that's, you know, incredibly hot topic right now, and therefore the value if you uh, if you placed advertisement in that specific post in this case could be incredibly high because of the number of eyeballs and the frequency of access. So I think it depends on several yeah. different variables to address that. But um, the short version is potentially yes. <laughs> so I think I think I think you're you're probably right about that. Uh, now I will say with a disclaimer that I've yet to meet a developer that writes any inefficient code by their own. <laughs> so let's just put that. Cap you haven't met any developers, is what you're telling. Wow, John, you are you are full of zingers today. I'm sorry. Wait, I'm sorry. That's, that's not what right. my no, team gotta, told you me. You got to get your quota. You got to get your quota. I love them. Espresso, guys. I'm sorry. I want just oh, let me I'll, I'll add to that and I'll say okay. Let, can we agree? Would we be able to agree that at least the starting point that a starting point could be that the existence of code that requests data, whether or not it's valuable or not, or poorly programmed or not, is to be determined. But the existence of code that requests the data is at least a starting point to begin exploring requests as a proxy for value. It's, it's a good question on that, um, John. Are you talking about the data that is returned from a query or a search? Because I would argue that if I get in a search for some sort of um, 
references. And if I, in every search, I always get uh, a reference to Webster's Dictionary. In every search, right? At a certain point, the value to me of knowing that it, you know, that Webster's Dictionary is going to show up as a, as a reference has, starts to have low value. So sure. part, of the, part of the issue is the nature of the application, nature of the query, or nature of the search. So yeah, I, so I would, I, would, I would bifurcate the concept of search from the concepts of calling data in the context of an IoT application. So, and, and to be transparent, I think that what, I think what adds the most interesting wrinkle to Dave's original theory is the Internet of Things. Um, so I'm 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 coming at it from the perspective of machines calling data, which still is, has to be software written by humans. But at the end of the day, it's machines calling data at variable velocities and frequencies. I think that's I think that's um, I think that's fair if it's machine to machine. That would be where I said uh, where I said it's kind of dependent on the situation. The Webster's Dictionary example that Rich gave, um, it, yes, having a, having that same thing appear again and again probably not all that valuable over time. Maybe valuable the first time, um, but that's one of the other natures of valuing data is um, what happens with value over time. Um, the decay, what, the decay of value, right? Well, there's, there's generally decay of value in context against data. So you have several different facets that end up affecting how data, how data's value exists over time, but it's, it's context-based. So one context um, will also exist in a specific amount of time. So an example might be a, uh, a bit of, uh, let's say, arbitrage data between uh, a stock's value in one, um, in one stock exchange versus another. And that arbitrage data um, might be incredibly valuable for uh, a few milliseconds. And in some cases, it's nanoseconds to milliseconds is the, is the time measurement of, of peak value for, uh, for that specific arbitrage right. data. But then when you move to the next context, that data is still has value at, at a reasonable level um, for maybe another uh, several hours potentially. And then, and, and so that might be general trading context or something like that. Then uh, you move to a new context and the context might be historical value. And historical value might follow a different, uh, a different overall value curve as well. So as yeah. you switch contexts, the, the value curve changes and the decay rate changes for that Absolutely. same piece of data. Absolutely. And that gets lost when we generally have discussions about data, unfortunately. People just think, yeah. oh, it's data, so it was valuable, it's not valuable. Yeah. Or no, you're, and, and, and by the way, taking your historical one step further, when you start using data historically as the basis for training for AI. It basically, the value of this historical data, basically data as code, because what it is actually doing is the, yep. it is generating, it is generating, you know, features that are being used for, for machine learning. So yeah, again, your context argument or your context statement is absolutely dead on. Yeah. What do you think about other other issues about affecting data gravity? Let's just say you have a you have a you have a collection, you have a repository of data sitting at an edge somewhere else, wherever. And there are there are any numbers of ways in which technologists try to defy gravity in a way by, for example, data virtualization. They try to, instead of moving all of the data to every part of a mesh, they'll just move 
some portions of it. They'll they'll virtualize it so that you have access to some important part of it in a different location. So you know we're 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 starting to get into Buck Rogers anti gravity belts, but you know I there's a whole notion of defying data gravity that I think one of the things technology continues to try to do. There's a kind of a there's an approach that we are all engaged in right now, which is fighting parts of data gravity. And once again, context is everything, but any thoughts on that? I think, I think the funny thing is that data gravity only exists because of the network. So without a network, you can't have data gravity. That network could be, uh, you know, a network inside of a uh, inside of a computer being the different buses and such that would be a network and data gravity exists inside of a singular computer or the internet where everything is connected globally and uh, and you have the the amassing and movement of, uh, of data uh, along with creation and processing the the manipulations that we do generally try to leverage uh, things within the network in different ways to try and get uh, to try and get an outcome that that better suits you. But ultimately, you're still just kind of trying to spread that problem around in different places, uh, or use the non rivalrous nature of data uh, to to better give you an, an advantage. Uh, and by the way, for those that that don't know what rivalrous versus non rivalrous is, um, a rivalrous consumption in economics of a resource is, uh, for example, a barrel of oil. Once you process a uh, once you process a barrel of oil and you turn it into gasoline and plastic and all of the other outcomes that you get out of that barrel of oil, it's used up. So once you've consumed a rivalrous resource, it's been consumed. Data is non-rivalrous, and that means you can use it again and again and again without depleting it, at least from the aspect of the thing itself. It can affect, uh, it can affect all of these other things um, such as value and context and such, but uh, overall the use is, uh, is very different uh, uh, when it comes to a, a non-rivalrous resource. And so that's why we keep trying to defy data gravity um, Really, we're just leveraging the network. Oh, I can move this over here. I can make a copy here. I can cache it. Um, you're simply trying to break the problem apart. When you do, though, you're uh, you're increasing the the overall mass of that data. You're just spreading it into more locations, but you've still increased the copies of that same data, uh, and potentially the at least the, use at least the partial the partial copy. I mean. That's right. This is what you know. Data virtualization tends to be about. I'm, I'm moving metadata about the primary data. If I don't need all of the primary data, and my app, my, once again, my context is such that only need some aspect or some some projection of that original kind of full chunk of prime primary data, I've in effect made the escape velocity a little lighter. I can make, I don't have to move as much of the data. I'm do, making it possible to operate on the data from a distance. You have, you have with the exception of um, that, what I would call that energy state, state side. So you've moved it, I probably because you're trying to deal with two problems, the, the, overall mass of the data versus that energy state that I was talking about, about that frequency. And so because there's such a high frequency, you're chunking off a small, a small piece of that data to deal with just that high frequency activity back and forth. But you're still bound by the fact that there's this high frequency occurring and you can't move that around um, as easily. You might be able to branch it off and have it uh, have that action happen as a well, shot. Well, I think that's what else. that frequency issue kind of goes back to John's point about um, value and this kind of an assessment of value based on utilization. Yeah. 
Okay. So can I, I have a couple of comments. One is I agree about some of your points about rival data not versus non-rival value, but the part of the assumptions in this in your the report that you published about data gravity is that there's going to be relative winners and losers in terms of geographies and enterprises that if, if you basically certain geographies are winners and losers you want to be connected close to each other um you had like twin cities i believe it was it was called in the report um, um there there wasn't a twin cities i i, I don't think it's the the report that's being referenced is uh, yeah. something that uh, Digital Realty produced that uh, that talks about uh, the data gravity index, which is something that that measures uh, uh, data gravity in specific metros. And 21 metros were chosen. Uh, that doesn't represent all metros, um, and all metros have yet to be measured. So definitely not uh, not all metros. As far as winners and losers, um, it's not winners and losers. It's it's what I would call measuring the present state. So, what is the state today versus um, what could the state be several years from now? I understand, but I also understand how economic development corporations and companies use this type of data to, for marketing purposes. Um, sure. so, um, so, but to just move things along, I have just a general question um, in terms of gravity. If you're on Mars, things are lighter. If you're on Mercury, things are heavier. The way I'm looking at this, you have bandwidth and latency. Bandwidth makes things lighter. Latency is basically just a measure of making things um, heavier. Is that a way to look at things? Um, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, uh, I was looking at it as uh, you have you have this um, overall uh, mass of data. You have this activity thing, and uh, for those things to occur more, you generally need more bandwidth. Uh, so more bandwidth encourages the growth of those things. Less bandwidth would uh, discourage the growth of those things. And uh, lower latency encourages and higher latency discourages. And so uh, if you think about two cities with each other, higher bandwidth between those cities would encourage those cities to do more between each other and lower latency would encourage them. And so, so you know, I, I was going to I was going to offer maybe a different way of thinking about it, because I understand where you're going, Lawrence, but I don't see those two necessarily on one continuum, but rather think of it more as a two dimensional continuum. So you ha you could relate um, the actual bandwidth as one dimension, kind of your your y axis, and then talk about latency as your x axis, because it's the combination of the two coming together. It's not simply just one works against it and one works toward it. The one more thing is just in terms of the math. I was playing in terms of your calculations. Is in terms of a uh, there's a maximum amount that latency could have a positive impact or a ne negative impact uh, with basically bandwidth ha only having, can, can have an unlimited positive impact, but a, a finite negative impact. So I'm just trying to figure that, that out in terms of looking at the implications. Yeah, I mean, uh, only there's another, I was just gonna jump in and just offer, there's another piece too, which is to think about, which is when you have unlimited bandwidth or have the the viewpoint of unlimited bandwidth or the perception of it, it also causes you to make other judgment calls because you aren't necessarily constrained by that. A constraint actually causes us to think differently about architecture and design. And so that's the other piece that I think we need to be careful is that you're not just talking about it in a vacuum, but rather thinking about how this applies in reality too. So this is Simon, can I toss in just a, a number? Every time you reach out <clears throat> to a database, you are about a million times slower 
than anything in memory. Okay, so we wonder why, well, we all go on about Muslim, but basically rest in dead bases um, have killed the last 10 years of Muslim because every time you reach out to some storage entity, which is remote, you're losing it all. And a million times slower is slow, given the volume of data. So that's a really great point that both Simon and Tim make. And to give further context, the, we have to worry about packaging of that data. Unlimited roads, bandwidth, as you, if you compare bandwidth to, okay, I have an eight lane or a 20 lane highway between two cities. If I'm transporting that in a container that can't take advantage of that bandwidth, then it's irrelevant. The, that, then I'm just spending my tires when it comes to bandwidth. So as we think about I.O. from uh, wherever the data source is at, disk, memory, or PMEM, doesn't matter. We're, we have to consider the container that's accessing that highway or broad bandwidth. This is where latency, et cetera, comes into a, a, a factor. But even less, I would argue at some point, low latency uh, because of if I'm making too, if I'm too, too, to Simon's point, if I'm too inefficient with my calls to the data, uh, latency can't fix that problem. Latency. There, there seem also to be a couple of other aspects that need to be factored in here. Um, think about the economic, given the Tim's, you know, kind of at least perception of unlimited bandwidth. The economics, I mean, quite frankly, you know, the economics of ingress and egress to a, a data store are going to effectively change the, the nature of or amplify the, the gravitational effect. Um, you've, got an, you've got an escape velocity. There's another issue that we haven't talked about, and that's jurisdictional uh, constraints on what data can exist or not. Uh, that also changes you know, the nature of, or the impact of gravity. It's a, it's a mediation or it's a moderation of gravity. Yeah, so, the other piece to that, Rich, was I'm not assuming cloud. So when I talk about unlimited bandwidth or yeah, relatively relative was, unlimited I, bandwidth, I wasn't yeah. thinking just restricting that to cloud, but also thinking on premise. No, well. I wasn't. I wasn't referring to cloud at all. I was gotcha. it, just networking and 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 distribution of data. Gotcha. So, so one one point I'd I'd like to make is um, it, infinite latency is no different than uh, than <laughs> downtime. So. No, no matter uh, no matter what someone thinks, if your if your latency is uh, three days of latency, um, for for most things, with the exception of some things uh, where we might measure uh, data from space or something, it's it's down. You're down. Um, so the the lower the latency, the better. It certainly doesn't address everything, as as we've pointed out. But in general. Uh, lower latency always benefits uh, and doesn't hurt. So if you have near zero latency, uh, you're not going to be negatively impacted with that unless you wrote your application to assume terrible latency. Dave, that, that's an awesome point because it's a slippery slope and you're going to get into consistency arguments. So what I see is the modern database guys putting more and more features in, right? Uh, for distribution and everything else. And sure, there are a lot of benefits to putting features in databases, but the cap theorem applies, right? Yes. And when there's a ton of data, particularly IoT style stuff, poss possibly eventual consistency, which is I can be partially disconnected for some time, but I'll learn about it later, um, is a better way to go. And that's kind of fascinating. It, it, so, it, it's a it's a stack of uh, assumptions, just like we make a stack of assumptions about 
uh, about the network and as Rich was mentioning about all of these other external influences about the network. And this is where a lot of, uh, a lot of cloud players and other people um, and governments and such uh, play games with data is what are these outside things that can happen? If you look, the simplest example is to look at ingress egress costs um, and how that affects uh, what's done with data and why we do things with data. So it's really easy to be outside of the direct chain of that, uh, that read, write, uh, access creation process and still manipulate the activities that occur because the environment itself is being, uh, is being manipulated uh, either via economically with costs and changes or with GDPR or some other approach uh, to discourage or encourage movement or behaviors. Oh, it's the data's in Germany, it has to stay in Germany. That's going to change the behaviors and what you do and where you cache things and what you're able to maybe create derivative assets of the data so they can be moved uh, outside of Germany. All those behaviors are, uh, are manipulations by that, by that environment that exists, uh, if, that, if that makes sense. I was, I was we, we in the back channel, and, and this was my one of my questions too, is about the egress, right? We, so far, we've sort of described this sort of natural data, natural data gravity phenomena, but there's these external manipulations where you're designing around egress costs, you're designing around the cost of transferring, things like that. Is these feels are, like yeah, those are those are also real aspects to this. They're also for, forces of nature. From this that. is where economics shows up, and we're talking about externalities. Yeah, and these externalities are, you know, again, it's the way people either protect data, it's the way they make money off of data, make money off of its movement. It's how do you make money off of data in motion? How do you make money off of data at rest? What constraints are you putting on it? And those are usually economic or regulatory or statutory. And that, you know, that mediates and change that that changes the effective gravity of of an arbitrary identified datum somewhere. So it's it's interesting. It's one of the things I think that that we're going. I was going to sort of put the frame into the the twenty thirty future frame because what you're describing to me are a whole bunch of great questions that you know, Dave. I know you're writing a book to help document like how do we make decisions about data gravity, um, and I guess is it's a, I have a paired question: um, Is data gravity like? escapable like it were you know gravity is a force you can't you can't you got to deal with it are we gonna just start baking data gravity into designs because there's no way around it um, and then once it's baked into model like when do you think it's going to be baked into the model that we actually start like in five years are we going to say oh okay this is I've got to design it through these networks or put these intermediate points or this service because I you know we actually understand Data gravity. My assumption being today we just sort of wing it. I think we have well, today in the world of in the world of our application that we that we have we have a central database sitting in U.S. East One, and we can't distribute our application because of that central database. But the idea is the clouds enable us to do a multi-region installation. So and that splits our data say in two or three, and then we can now put it in multiple like ten regions or twenty regions. So cloud, if you talk about cloud 2030, looking forward, the cloud enables us to reduce the data gravity by partitioning the data, basically taking the whole cap thing and breaking it out uh, horizontally, kind of. So the, the, the question there though, uh, and, and Mike, I mean, I think that's a great point. Um, and, and this may be a, a, a really hard, um, uh, deep question, but um, you know, uh, Tim hinted at it earlier, Rich hinted at it a little bit, um, as did Rob, um, in the notion of how do we architect rather than um, 
uh, solve for. And what we're doing today most of the time is we're making pragmatic decisions in how we architect based on limitations around cost. Most I mean, that's, that's really what it boils down to. It's around cost. And so we don't care about um, cost. <laughs> and that's great. I mean, some, some people can do that. But the only reason you cannot care about cost is because you have some other greater value. Right. There's there's obviously some other greater value in at least in nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine times out of circumstances. It would be some other greater value to where the cost is meaningless for what you do with the data. But we make pragmatic decisions on every IT project. And to me, and this may not be the right analogy, but to me, data is very much like the gasoline and the diesel to the highway. The highway is the network, the national network for us. Uh, transporting goods and services across the United States and the U S government still makes 10 cents on every dollar that they spend on the national highway system through taxes and growth and businesses. The data to the network is the next piece in order to accelerate. So gasoline and diesel, if that's not available, then we don't have transport. The network becomes useless and unimportant. So to me, whatever we can do to free up, effectively unabridged use of network and data is ought to be part of the target because today effectively everything we do is based on what are the limitations we have to fight against relative to cost we come up with a pragmatic can fit this situation type of IT solution and and um, I think breaking those barriers is where the opportunity is. I would be cautious. I get the idea of uh, freeing the transport of a network, but uh, data, um, data, you can't necessarily just free up uh, no, in all no, ways. Dave, yeah, that, Dave, I don't, I don't mean that you can just have data everywhere. There are even with that, there are limitations to uh, to the the very points that most people don't recognize about your data gravity strategy or idea. Um, uh, things like the metadata associated with it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, changes happening in one place that don't happen in another that, that manipulate the value of the data. Um, but so many of our decisions, uh, even about simple IT projects are made based on how much network can I get? Um, does storage cost a lot of money? Well, the idea that I was saying with the, with the cloud is the cloud enables me to partition my data. So yep. I can, based on geography, I can partition data, put data relevant to the U.S. and the U.S., relevant to Europe and Europe, and then keep doing that in the cloud as regions. And then if you look forward in cloud, I'm sure there'll be more and more ways to partition my data to be more localized. And so cloud is kind of helping with the data gravity thing like that. So I think, well, actually, Mike, I think I, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, Sorry, I was talking over someone. I'm not sure I, I understand your, your logic on that because the the way I see that, what you're doing is you're just, you're just starting with smaller gravity um, domains and, and building them out over time. You're not really, you're not really freeing yourself of anything because you're still stuck in those specific zones and in those clouds, right? So but if I keep making them smaller and smaller, <laughs> then... <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, what is edge? Edge is just putting the minimal amount of data at each part, right? So yeah, now... But the, Sure, but uh, no, that's no that's not at all. <laughs> I guess I, the way I the way I saw it, Mike, was that I think unless I'm misunderstanding you and misunderstanding Tealy, which okay, there's a big question mark there, and it's very common um, for those of you that know me. But <laughs> you, the, it's my point is this, to misunderstand Tealy. Yeah, I get that. The, I guess the, the thing I was getting from this is I think Tealy and Mike, I, th I feel like you're talking about two different aspects, two completely different aspects. I heard Tealy talking more about the economics and other factors that come into driving your decisions. Whereas Mike, I, I kind of felt like you're talking more about kind of ways that, that you technologically will, will parse the data or operationalize the data, um, which are somewhat related, but two different things. Because when I, when I was listening to what Mark was saying, um, I think there, there's a whole line of thinking there that frankly, Mark, you just scratched the surface of yeah. that comes into play. You know, when I'm thinking as an IT leader, when I'm thinking about data and thinking about customer engagement and having those conversations with other executives, 
we're not talking about, okay, where do we put the data, you know, the oper 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 operationalization of the data. We're talking about how we're going to use it and the cost constraints and the rest that, that come into it, right? The, the business decisions that we might make around it as drivers. And so I think you have to address both of them, but I think the, the one thing to be careful about is to conflate the two. Dave, I have some, actually have a question for Dave to, to comment on. And that would be, it's not, would you say that it is context that would impact a difference or flavors of gravity that would cause a certain kind of data and nature of data to collect in one spot and a different one to collect in somewhere else. I mean, Mike was just talking about retaining data in a geography where it's being collected, near where it's being used, doing that. Is there, I mean, are we talking about something that is not universally applied to every datum, but rather there's something else that we're, we really have to identify that allows us to kind of char characterize or, or typify data such that you can establish flavors of gravity or flavors of attractive. I, I think, can, can Toronto, I actually, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> I was I was going to say I think there I think there are uses of data and if you wanted to classify each use of data as a context then I would say yes you could have data that exists in the same context that's being used um, uh, by two different groups and one group uses it in that context once a month for a monthly report and you could have another group that's using it. 24 hours a day, all the time, nonstop. And the group that's using it all the time, nonstop, would be more benefited by having that data closer to them, closer to the services and processes that consume the data and such, um, than the group that's using it monthly. Um, and that would drive all sorts of other behaviors. That well, this gets data back by group one, it, in other words, what I'm saying is you have context for the data and you have context of use. In well, this gets back to your activity, your activity portion. If, if the activity around the data is distinctly regionalized or localized, that's going to change it. So in a sense, we're not, we're not dealing with gravity so much as we're dealing with, we're dealing with light. It's an albedo. It's, you know, it's a, it's a measure of absorption or it's a measure of luminescence. I'm not sure which, so but let's, Let's talk about that. I mean, so that I'd starts like to, to change the, the whole nature of the physics of data, not just, not just gravity. I'd like to inject a, a historical perspective here. And that is libraries, library science, library stuff, um, all that. Back before the internet, libraries shared data. Uh, people, they would share their, their metadata of what they had, and then people would request it. If a library requested some data too often, they would go and buy the book. Different libraries had different contexts, uh, engineering libraries, general libraries, uh, literature libraries, law libraries. Uh, I think that looking to the internet archives, and uh, I know they've done lots and lots of data, uh, well, They've done lots and lots of item uh, investigation and keeps lots of data and does lots of analysis and whatnot on their data. I think talking to Brewster Kale about this could be extremely enlightening uh, and get some information. But besides libraries, there are also, uh, for instance, a company called Ab Initio that has a different way of attacking use of data and speed of processing and whatnot. 
Uh, uh, third thing to look at is decentralization. They're trying to solve this problem as we speak. And Brewster Kill is one of the big players in it, but it's how do you distribute it all? Um, also on the internet archive, when Trump came into office, suddenly their need to distribute their data became much more extensive because they had to get stuff out of the country to protect it from our government as opposed to other governments. So taking a look at history and how library and library science dealt with distribution, uh, the networking aspects, the bandwidth, uh, the latency and whatnot would be extremely useful in informing the data gravity discussion. Uh, just ro Rocky, I just want yeah. to, so Dave, I don't want to, and we have to run out. This is related to what Rocky was saying. My other critique, I had a lot of critiques of the paper. And I know you didn't write the whole entire paper. It was the whole entire Oh, I paper. did. I wrote every single line myself, <laughs> and I did all of it. <laughs> but it was related. It was basically, they were trying to make the point that a lot of it was going to be private enterprise hosted data. And I wasn't sure. And so that goes to what Rocky was saying in terms of there's a lot of public domain data that's still out there. And that's something that's pretty interesting. And I just threw something into the chat about data the collaboratives. And there's a whole entire open data world that, that Bruce O'Neill is involved with. I want to check that out. The, just for clarity, that the study that was done was only with Global 2000 data. So it did not include anything else at all. So all the assumptions and everything are all Global 2000 enterprise and nothing else, which may account for um, some of the things that you see versus um, normally a whole metro. Makes sense. And so, yeah, uh, I'd love to talk to you more later. I know everyone has sure. things to do. We, we do need to wrap it up, but I didn't expect this to be an easy topic to fit in time inside of 45 minutes. So Dave, thank you for coming. Please keep coming back. We're, your, your name is frequently mentioned in the, as we as data gravity, I think, is the underpinnings of a lot of what we have to figure out. So economics, we I think, in two weeks. To, we haven't gotten to talk about 2030 with data gravity at all yet. Yeah, yeah. I know. That's that's <laughs> the seating. That's the this is this is why these are a long standing well, standing meeting for a lot of conversations. But maybe we'll take it up. Right. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate okay, it. Everybody. Everybody. Great conversation. Next week is Gina with uh, Programmed Inequity. And then we're, econ we're going back to economics because obviously that one's not done. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to wrap it up though in one hour, I promise. Thanks. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Good October. <laughs>